on here for a few minutes till I'm sure that we've gone live. So I think I've clicked on live. And if somebody would just sort of give me a thumbs up in the chat uh, that we're live, I will continue the uh, discussion. So I'm going to also click over here just to make sure that things are happening. Uh, discussion. Yep, it does like we go on. So it looks like we're okay. So Pete Garcia, I think this is the first time we've ever done this, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was saying yesterday, you know, I've been friends for a number of years now. Yeah, we've had some pretty long chats uh, before and as you're going. So are you still, are you done with the military now or? Yeah, yeah. I retired officially the second time in uh, December of 20. Okay, and this time they haven't bugged you, right? <laughs> well, you know, you never know. I mean, if if if, if the president administration manages to get into some kind of uh you know, multi-theater operation or conflict. I mean, I, I, I mean, I could easily get called back up. Right. Now. So Jerry Cochran asked a question. Yes, Jerry, this is live. This is actually going on right now. Pete and I uh, talking live together for the first time. And uh, so I, I do have a live coming up, everybody. So, you know, I have a live, uh, well, it's a, it's going to be streamed uh, as a premiere on our YouTube channel at uh, Fellowship Bible Chapel with uh, Avraham Levine from the Alma Research and Education Center in Israel. I have to tell you, uh, I'm not usually one to go out there and, and to my own horn. This is an interview you need to watch. This is an incredible individual, incredibly knowledgeable. He's like Pete. He has a lot of military experience. He's a father of eight. He actually got you beat, Pete, on by three, I think, on the kids. <laughs> And um, he actually, I, I'm trying to figure out how old he is because he served in Lebanon in, um, I think he was about 20 years old. He was born in Israel, lives in the Golan, and served in the Lebanon War. He's like in 2000, he was up there, he was like a 20-year-old. So I think he's about 45 now, is what he said. And he, October 7th happens, and October 8th, he's in the reserves and he goes into Gaza. So I want to ask you a little bit about that. So maybe I ought to just do that just first. So this was an incredible interview. People, you at 2.30 or after, it will be available after, go to FBC's YouTube channel. I'm going to also try to put it up on Real FBC Rumble. I haven't had a chance to do that yet. My staff took the day off. <laughs> like I'm the staff I'm nice and staff, doing yeah. two of these in one day is and Pete, you know how hard it can be. It's just really, really uh, difficult. But anyway, at two 30, if we're not done, uh, I don't think I can stream being too live with appears to be two live things at the same time. because I think the universe will end then or something <laughs> like that. So, um, this guy was so incredible. So, so Pete, you have military training. I don't. Uh, I have bad knees. That's a, that's sort of my excuse. But uh, what what Abraham told me was this thing in Gaza is incredibly different or uh, difficult. Uh, he said, uh, and, and so here's the example. Uh, yesterday or the day before, Israel the IDF went back to Al-Shifra Hospital in Gaza. I think it's in Gaza City. And when they got there, it was reoccupied mm -hmm. by Gaza terrorists. They arrested hundreds of them and killed about 150. That's, and, and his point was, when we look at the map, in the New York Times or Post or any place else, Institute for Study of War, it looks like Israel controls all of this area of Gaza, and they just haven't gone into Rafa yet. But he said that's a complete illusion because of the way it is. He said, so you go through and you clear this area, and you have to go room by room, check the floors and all this stuff, and you clear it. So they cleared Al Shifa Hospital a couple of times. They go back yesterday, and there's hundreds of terrorists there again. And he said, and it's like you clear an area, and you go back 20 minutes later, and a guy might pop up and throw an RPG at you. 
and, and could, you know, theoretically kill you. <laughs> so you're a military guy. I mean, have you ever experienced anything like this? I mean, is it part of your training? And does that kind of indicate to you how difficult this is? Well, I mean, I was a I was a medevac pilot, so I wasn't actually clearing rooms and things like that. But I was in Iraq in 2005 and 2006, so right in the thick of uh, conflict there. And, and I would say that the experiences that we saw uh, mainly around Baghdad and around uh, Sadr City and some of these other really heavily populated areas is that urban operations are incredibly hard to do. It is incredibly tough. Um, right. And, you know, you're looking at a country like Iraq or even if you went into a, a country like Afghanistan that is, um, you know, third, um, they call that a third third state nation or whatever, uh, you know, they, they just don't have a lot of buildup. If you fly over Kandahar or Kabul, there's not very many buildings that are over two stories high. Um, but but when you get in Iraq, it's a little bit more developed. Um um, so even there, it was considerably challenging. And then in Gaza, if you look at the way Gaza is constructed, at least the, from the videos and pictures, it resembles in terms of the number of uh, taller buildings and things like that. Uh, uh, you know, like most uh, smaller cities in, in the United States, and uh, that that is incredibly challenging. So you not only have to work floor by floor up in elevation to clear the rooms above you and worry about booby traps, worry about the building collapsing on you. And they also have, you know, as we, we're finding out now, uh, an extensive subterranean con, uh, complex underneath most of Gaza. So uh, the Israelis have, the IDF has an incredibly tough job there. And I would imagine it's very much like uh, nailing jello to the wall, trying to uh, clear out a place, you move on to the next place and they just kind of squish around you and move back into the place that you just cleared, you know? So it, it's, he, he it's said that really tough. He said, that's exactly what's happening. He said, and I, I guess I didn't really till I talked to somebody who'd actually been there. So when I was in Israel for the, uh, Israeli government Christian media summit in December, 2022, they took us down to the Gaza border. We went to uh, kibbutz down there near them. And I think it's the closest kibbutz to the border border fence. And they, and by the way, Niram didn't do too bad because Niram, they had had um, a couple guys killed in a rocket attack. And then one of the guys that lived there lost his legs in that rocket attack. And they had had uh, terrorists pop. There's a fence, you know, a security fence around the entire kibbutz, but they've had, they had guy, or one day the, the field, it's a farm. They had the tractor out there and the tractor w fell down into the, into the ground because a tunnel had collapsed that they had built. They were coming to take people from the kibbutz. Okay. So the, they're about a half mile from the border fence, their border, their security fence is about a half mile from the border fence. So they had built a tunnel all that way. Um, and so I think because of that experience, they were a little bit better organized with guns and security and that type of thing. It's just, um, it, it, it it's hard for me to, to grasp how difficult this is, but they took us to the Urban Warfare Training Center also the same day. And we went through there. It's a mock-up of Gaza City. And they had a tunnel. Now, I didn't go through the tunnel because I'm a, you know, as I said, I'm a 2X guy in a 1X world. <laughs> and I was afraid that they would have to do some kind of emergency extraction to get this stupid lawyer pastor from Ohio to get out of the uh, this, uh, this, this tunnel. Um, but he said that, the tunnel system, so Avraham Levine told me this morning, he said the tunnel system, the assumption was it was, you know, 300 kilometers, which is about 180, 200 miles of tunnels. Now they're finding that it's like five or 600 miles of tunnels, and it's far more complex, far more extensive than anybody knows. And they haven't even been able to map the thing when they're in there. So what he told me, though, was that the – he said – oh, by the way, 
every I, I'm going to tell everybody what's in the interview and then they'll, they'll think, well, I don't need to listen. No, you need to listen to it. But uh, as we were walking through this urban warfare center, you had the two, three, four story buildings. You had windows everywhere. And so every every wall, every door, every closet in every room and every window is like a point of attack mm -hmm. and you clear it. But then they come back through the tunnel and pop up and it's it's like um, it's like whack-a-mole and it never finishes. So he said in every home in Gaza is a map, a detailed map of Palestine with no Israel. And that every home is like that. Now, he says not everyone's a terrorist. Everybody knows that. But that they all have this mentality and it's drummed into them that Israel really has no right to exist. Now, he said in the north, it's a little bit different. And the mayors up there of these towns in Lebanon say every third home or every other home is owned or controlled by Hezbollah. And the tunnel system, they fear, may be um, even more extensive than in Gaza. So the question is, how are they going to do this? I mean, you're, you're a military guy, you know, logistics and stuff. What, what's it going to take for Israel to, to get rid of the threat in the North and in Gaza? I mean, uh, I think somebody here in chat is saying, well, it seems like they're too polite with <laughs> how they're going to Gaza. And I think part of it, you said one of the benefits of what we're doing in Gaza is we can, those pictures get up to Hezbollah and they're like, okay, if you mess with us, we're going to do this to you guys. But I mean, what are your thoughts on this? I, I, I'd be interested to hear them. Well, I, I've, I've been of the uh, mind since October 7th, really probably about October the 8th, that I considered this to be Psalm 83. Now, I know that's, uh, you know, different opinions on this, but when you look at the reality that Israel is now facing a multi-front war, I think seven fronts, um, primarily uh, Sunni flavor. Um, it, it just seems to me like this this kind of fits that category. And if that is true, and if that is correct, then I believe Israel, the IDF, will be successful in neutralizing the threat in their immediate area. So that would yeah, include. I, th I think they're going to win. I mean, yeah, th they're winning in Gaza, and they're neutralizing um, Hamas. But the problem is, you know, Hamas had 20,000 rockets. Hezbollah has, you know, 10 times that amount or more. And but many the, of those can bring into play every place in Israel with precision yeah, I, so guided weapons. I, I've been doing a lot of research on, on Iran and... Um, Obviously, Hezbollah being their uh, part of their overarching geopolitical strategy to wage conflict against Israel without themselves actively being in a, a hot war with Israel has the the bulk of, of Iranian uh, benefits in terms of missiles and, and fighters and, and the, they've had the time to, I mean, they've had a lot more time to build tunnels and to do those things longer than um, Hamas has. But with respect to Hamas, I, I think it because of the way this attack was carried out on October 7th and because it's not being equated to uh, Yom Kippur or any other type of uh, war conflict, it's being equated back to the Holocaust in terms of the gravity and the, and the barbarity of it. I think they are going to they are going to get um, uh, less polite going forward into this as it becomes uh, abundantly mean, clear that this the, thing IDF is, the IDF yeah. in Israel is going to get less polite. Yeah. And, and that may include flooding. Well, here's the, you know, here's why they're, I feel like they're fighting somewhat uh, less aggressively than they could be is because they don't know where these hostages are and they don't want to go in and, and um, say flood all the tunnels and they've got, you know, a hundred plus hostages down there. And then they've just drowned all their hostages. So, I mean, there's just so much ambiguity regarding the hostages. So I think until they get some clarity on that and figure out where they are 
they may go on a, 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 a scorched earth kind of policy moving from north to south if they realize all of the hostages are down in this, you know, in Rafa, for instance, if they're somewhere in that neighborhood, then then they could move down scorched earth. They could flood tunnels. They could uh, pollute the tunnels to the extent that, that you couldn't use them anymore. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there's and technology is such today, like, you know, I mean, I was doing teaching classes back in 2017 when I was still in and we had a page full of drones. Um, you know, you had every kind of drone you could think of. You had Senate drones that looked like centipedes, drones that flew, dr drones that went underwater, that were subterranean, that were uh, that could climb walls, you know, looked like they were insectoid, oh, anthropod, really? you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's that was what uh, 17. So is that seven years ago? And I'm, I'm sure that's quadrupled since then. And so they have, uh, you know, out of any other country in, at least in the Middle East, I mean, Israel would have a wide variety of drones to use. And, and so I would imagine that they could, um, if they so chose to, they could pretty much neutralize Gaza very fast. They, right now, it's just a question of where the hostages are. They don't know where they are. Yeah. Or at, least, it's, at least we don't know that they know. And, and going in there and the hostages, I mean, they're pretty sure that about si at least 60 of the 130 are probably already dead. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the political situation, you know, you have people marching in protest about bringing them home and that type of thing. And so, you know, politicians see that. IDF guys see that. I just think it's sort of a, I think it's a unique, almost unique situation in modern warfare, maybe in history of warfare, where you have this terror base that's so deeply embedded in the tunnels. And so you clean the tunnel, you clear the area, but then they pop up through a new entrance that was never there before, an air shaft or something like that. And they have a complete map of, of everything that they have. They know where all the, the exits, entrances, and points of attack are in these tunnels. And, and so I, I don't know. I mean, the, the implication of, of uh, Abraham's talk with me was they're going to be at this for a while. But then you layer on top of that the north. Uh, so he lives up in the Golan. And he said it's, it's worse up there because of the risk of rocket attacks that they can launch. I mean, they have precision-guided rockets up there, not just this stuff that they literally are manufacturing in their basement in Gaza. And it can reach anywhere in Israel. So right now, in the north, they have... 60 to 80,000 people who've left their homes. And, and he said, they don't have school. They don't know where to have school. How long are they going to be gone? How long are they going to be out of their home? And I don't think here in the United States, I talked to Tom Hughes yesterday, and he just got back from Israel. And Avraham said this, Tom also said this, there's nobody there. There's no tourist in the country. I mean, you, you go to a site and you're the only, if you're on a tour, and you've been able to, you've decided to take the risk to go. There's nobody else there. And Abraham yeah. said, this is the best time of year to come to the Golan. Nobody's coming to the Golan for a year, <laughs> probably. And that, of course, people have Airbnbs, they have hotels, they have their tour guides, all this, they have no income. Tom, I think it was, Tom told me he got a guy at the Jaffa Gate and a cab. It was an Arab guy to take a cab someplace. The guy said, you're my first fear since October 7th. Wow. How do, how do you live? How, how, how does the economy survive that? So over all the Israeli economy, I think the first report came out and said, we're down 20% in a quarter. I mean, if that happened in the United States, people would be, you know, marching on Washington. I, yeah. I don't. I don't know the answer. I'm not. I just know that clearly, this does seem to square with some of the things we read in Psalm 83, and it does seem to be incredibly important from a Bible prophecy standpoint. I think. I think if, if in regards to Hezbollah, in order for them to deal with that threat, which seems to be the case that they're going to, that's the follow on operation or the subsequent operation after they neutralize Hamas is that 
you know, at least from my perspective, would be to make an example. Uh, and, and that would probably come in the form of some massive either Moab or uh, even tactical nuke, which may explain an Isaiah 17 scenario, which right. seems impossible or not, not impossible, but it seems implausible right now that they would do something like that. But when you consider the, um, the need to uh, end this sooner rather than later because of the, the global um, pushback against their current operations, they, they're not going to have this, whatever goodwill they have going from now that's already eroded, it's going to be that much more eroded by the time they move into the summer months. But um, not only that, but you've also got Iran who is racing towards uh, finishing their uh, nuclear uh, capabilities in terms of the, the missile payload uh, with the enrichment, in which that article is really excellent. That Okay, yeah, I see, so I, this I, article... I see that very much as part of a... a Weapons of mass distraction program by Iran to, to right. hit Israel so, from, from so many different angles that they don't have time to focus on Iran. Yeah, so let me just tell people what I'm talking about. The article you see up on the screen is an article at JNS. And in my interview with Avraham, I, there's a link to it in the description to that. And I'll try to put a link in the description to this video. But this was published at uh, uh, JNS last night. Hamas attack is a weapon of mass distraction as Iran nuke program advances. So the um, uh, uh, Yaakov Lapine, who wrote the article for JNS, and he also has a similar article published a couple of days ago at Alma Research. And that website is israel-alma.org. And there's a few websites that I say, these are absolute good go-to websites, uh, jns.org. Um, I mean, I, I follow mid, you know, J post the Middle East forum. And I would also say Alma research Israel hyphen Alma.org because you're going to get, I mean, these are the people who live there and are living this and they're going to talk about it. So this Yaakov Lapine, he cites a guy in this article named, uh, Brigadier General Professor, uh, Yaakov Nagel. And he was a former acting national security advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And his theory is that while that 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 Iran may be more involved in this than they've said, than other people have said, that they they sort of encourage they train the people in Gaza to do this. And so now they have Gaza, they have everybody distracted with Gaza. And I see in the comment, people are tired of it being talked about. Well, you better get used to it because you're going to be talking about Gaza for a while now. Yeah. And But now you have the problem. And they don't even talk about what's going on up in in Iraq, uh, on the Lebanon border, in Lebanon, and Syria. Because it's it doesn't seem like much, but Israel has made something like 4,000, 5,000 rocket missile bomb attacks on targets in Syria, in, in southern Syria and southern Lebanon. And they've taken out a bunch of Hezbollah leaders. Hezbollah publishes at the, at the um, Almar TV station or TV website in Lebanon. They publish all the, Hamad, the uh, Hezbollah fighters that have been killed. There are like 400 of them. Which is almost as many as they had in the whole second Lebanon or more. Yeah. So the um, and so he says that what so Iran's got everybody looking at the north. They got Israel tied up in the south with their brigades. They've caught up all these reserves, and now there's a and there's a lot of military activity moving towards the north. People have said, but in the meantime. Iran's using what they call these weapons of mass distraction as a cover for them to proceed to build their weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, and they're and not so, just after, they're just not after Israel. They're they're coming after us too. Yeah, and so when you look at Iran, you know Iran, and you think about okay, from the United States perspective, I, we would not consider them a near peer threat. Right. They are not an ex an existential threat to the United States where 
uh, Iran's strength lies in is not in their military necessarily, although they have uh, they do have military capabilities, uh, both in the um, Artesh and then the past Iran, the, the regular Ar- Iranian army, the land forces or the traditional army, conventional forces, and then the, IR- the IGRCs, the Islamic Guard, a revolutionary corps, they are uh, the IGRC, um, which is more of their special forces type. Um, they they do have military capabilities, but where Iran's strength really lies is in a couple of things. One is in their strategic planning and that they position themselves between two other larger uh, near peer threats to the United States. And, you know, I would say to the West in general by positioning themselves in between the Russia and China and becoming strategic partners and creating those alliances. They've also been very successful in creating these proxies all throughout the Middle East, all across Iraq, where there's a, a growing a Shia majority in Iraq, um, as well as the Houthis in Yemen, the uh, Hamas, which you know we're coming to find out is very well, you know, uh, was better equipped, better trained, better uh, funded to create all these tunnels than than what was previously thought. And then to the primary uh, proxy, which is obviously Hezbollah to the north in Lebanon. And so they've been very successful in creating this network of proxies throughout. And I would even extend this to say that their proxies probably include a large number of sleeper cells that have successfully came across the southern border and probably the northern border in airports and everywhere else and are currently in the United States and in Canada and Western Europe uh, waiting for whatever that trigger is going to be at some point going forward. Okay. Um, so let me, now, let me interrupt you there for a second. So, and I agree with you 100% that these people have come. Okay. And, uh, and I think Avraham mentioned this. I can't remember if it was in the interview or talking before or after that, whatever, whatever weapons Iran's providing to people, missiles to Russia and you to use in Ukraine drones for Russia to use in Ukraine, which is causing Russia to become more involved in that whole northern border area, particularly in Syria. The, but he said, the whatever whatever is in range from Iran in terms of drones and the Houthis and everything, is in range of the United States from Venezuela, and the same supply aircraft that takes stuff to Syria and then transfer over to Lebanon, or they're coming to Venezuela also. And so my yeah. question to you is, so you're a military guy, you've got security training. What? Let's assume that this is a risk for us. What do we do? How do we prepare? Because look, the people in the, the, the largely left-leaning people that live down in the kibbutzim, along the Gaza border or peace loving leftist and Gaza took advantage of, and a lot of them were unarmed. And so the question is, I mean, what, what's a good solid family guy to do here in the United States, by the way, Pete, the other night we have a community of about next to Minneapolis we're the largest community of Somalian immigrants in the United States. It's probably 150,000. It, it's it's about half of what they have in the Minneapolis area. They just I, I saw the videos. They elected a Muslim guy to the state house, and I mean because they live in a very closed community, and so my concern is you know, and then they're not all they're not all terrorists. That's not what I'm saying. But what if five or ten percent of them are? Well, that that would be, you know. 10% of them would be 15,000 people mm-hmm. just down the road from where I live. Gaza, I mean, had, uh, Hamas only had maybe 30,000 total in Gaza. And I probably had 50,000. I mean, what? <laughs> I don't know. What do you do? I think, I think, I think first and foremost, it's just, just having the, the awareness <laughs> that this is a potential not just this year, but I mean, in the years that will follow, if we're still here, 
um, is having that public awareness first and foremost and, and being cognizant of those things when you're out and about in different places, especially on paying attention to key dates and key, key times where things could likely be uh, a highly symbolic victory if a terrorist attack were to occur, like say 4th of July, you know, as an example, right. or election day or something, you know, something that is significant to the West or to the United States would be something that the Muslims would, or the terrorists would use as a means to um, strike a public uh, 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 publicity so, uh, uh, victory in their mind, even if, even if a lot of people don't die or aren't killed or injured or whatever, they could so do it maybe, in a highly visible enough way. They could get a, a yeah. publicity photo out of it, you know. Well, so so maybe, you know, nine eleven anniversary or something like that. Yeah, that would yeah. Be a, it, another key dates to watch. I, no, I don't. So when I talk about sleeper cells, and I mentioned this on my on my own live streams, I I don't necessarily see another nine eleven style happening on into that scale. But what uh, Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum guys were talking about uh, this year being poly crisis. I could easily see a number of uh, localized attacks happening across the United States in conjunction with, say, a cyber attack on hitting various key things. And then you could you multiply that a couple of times or compound it on top of each other across the board in a very short period of time. That could be uh, just cause for the federal government to say, hey, we need to um, postpone the election or we can't trust the results of the election because of all of these cyber attacks and so on and so forth. And so when I when I look at uh, poly crisis and we look at Iran and this all kind of goes back to Iran, where, where are their strengths? Where, where are their strengths in? They, they obviously have strategic mindset to place themselves between two powerful um, enemies to the United States. They specialize in hybrid warfare. They specialize in um, they don't. They don't have the manpower anymore after the eight-year conflict with Iraq. They lost a, a you know, easily two generations of men, uh, of young men during that conf that eight-year conflict. So their numbers are not where they would be uh, had that war not happened. But they've specialized in drones. They specialized in cyber attacks. They've specialized in. Uh, they were you know they were complicit in email hacking and things like that back in the 2020 election. So we look at what their strengths are. Where, where, where would they likely attack? And so having that awareness, having that cognizance going forward and being mindful of dates that might be might be a victory for uh, a public a publicity victory for them if they were able to, to kick off some type of attack on a date, even if a lot of people don't die, if enough media attention comes to it and so forth, that could be a victory in their minds, right? And then secondly, um, take the threat seriously. You know, don't shrug it off. I would I would reach out to public leaders, to your sheriffs um, to say, hey, sheriff, what's what's our plan for, you know, X, Y and Z around these key dates? What what is what is the department looking at um, in terms of that? So um, bringing that up to your local elite, local leaders, um, obviously being prepared yourself in terms of having supplies of food and water and not I'm not saying prepping in the sense of building a bunker or anything like that. I'm saying having enough food and water to last if the power goes off, if things shut down, if there's a some kind of a banking holiday because the banks got hit with cyber attacks or whatever, you know, having enough cash on hand or things, just being a general preparedness. <laughs> yeah. And then we, of course we had a tornado come through about a half mile South of here last week and we didn't have power for about 20 hours. Now it's, um, it's not like we were suffering, you know, I could, I could, go down the the road to the to the big shopping mall or over to church to use internet because we don't have power we don't have internet and we have a generator but the internet provider doesn't have a generator at their wherever their switch is so we're at and it's just so we're prepared but i'm telling you it you know we live in a, a bit you know in our neighborhood i don't think there may be one other generator in the whole neighborhood I mean, we're like the only ones. And I drove well, down through neighborhoods near us and, you know, there's, I don't know if they have power yet because we had two of those giant, you know, electrical towers just across the lake from us knocked down. So it was a miracle we had power back in 20 hours, but uh, 
it's it's it, weird because when that happens, you're not you're not prepared. I mean, I, I would say prepared and it's it's tough. Yeah, I would say I would say in those cases, have a grill, have a charcoal wood, whatever, <laughs> to be able to cook food. Well, on a it's, grill it's you funny to, you say you that because when I drove through one of the neighborhoods that was hard hit, the the grills were all trashed by the store. <laughs> they were all yeah. sitting out by the the curb to be picked up. So that's a, that's a little bit different situation <clears throat> than these attacks. But so and I want you to comment on this. Abraham says, listen, if, if they start attacking all, he says they've shut down the Southern border around Gaza, the Northern border around Lebanon with no real war coming into Israel, but the people have left. He said, if Hezbollah cuts loose, it shuts down all of Israel. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, there won't be school in Israel for a year. Yeah. I don't think we it, really think about that. And that's that's why I go back to the idea that Israel is going to have to make an example and they're going to have to hit as hard as, as, hard as we hit uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, they're going to have to do this to that effectively nullifies the fighting spirit in that region they're going to have to hit so hard that nobody else would dare attack them. Now they're going to risk uh, the ire of the world <laughs> in doing so. Right. But I, they, it's either that or they, as a country, they collapse because then, like you said, I mean, Hezbollah has so many missiles, has so many things, uh, so many more advantages in terms of how long they've been funded and supplied. They are, they are an ex existential threat to Israel. And, if, if Hamas has proven to be this difficult, and, and granted, we're also keeping in mind that they're having to keep the hostages in mind right. and trying to get them out, as many of them alive as possible. So that's part and parcel why they're not going as hard as they could be. But um, with all that said, I, you know, it could be that Israel t uh, launches this type of nuclear attack on um, Iran's nuclear capabilities and effectively nullifies, uh, kills two birds with one stone saying, hey, we're going to hit this area uh, where all the reactors and the underground facilities are with such a massive force, show of force, yeah, yeah. that that scares Hezbollah into uh, saying, hey, we don't want that. Or, you know, it could be well, that in Damascus. Yeah, it could be any yeah, number of things. But does it but really does scare, scare them scare when them their when religion they're... says, hey, I'll just die as a martyr and I'll go to paradise? I, I don't know, Pete. I don't have an easy answer to this one. You know, we, we've talked about this Bible prophecy stuff, uh, me for longer than you since I'm older, but, um, you know, now that we're here, it's, it's sort of like, okay, this is not really what I expected it to be like. It, it's, it's beyond what I thought. And so we can argue, you know, we, we don't agree on timing of the rapture and everything. We agree on almost everything else, but the, um, you know, the question somebody asked me was, well, what are we going to see before we're out of here? And the answer is, well, you're going to see at least as much as you've already seen <laughs> yeah. and maybe more. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm looking at, you know, so I'm looking at here at uh, um, this prophecy in Psalm 83. And, you know, you get down to Psalm 83, 11, make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb and all their princes like Zeba and Zalumna. I think that's a clear reference to Islam, uh, Islamic orientation of the enemies of Israel. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have any answers. I just have a lot of a lot more questions now than I used to. Yeah. Well, you know, ultimately, we know we know a couple of things. Right. So there is a lot of things we don't know, uh, like Donald Rumsfeld used to say that the unknown unknowns and, and all that. Um but there are a lot of things, you know, it's like that picture of the prophet. I think Clarence Larkin drew it, but it was a, a, the prophet standing here and he's looking off into the distance and he could see the, the mountaintops. He could see the things right. that are happening, but he couldn't see the valleys. He couldn't see what was happening. So we have a great outline in scripture that does say that that there is conflicts in the future that are going to happen. And here are the key players. So Gog, Magog, for example. Uh, clearly, we know that Iran is involved in this because uh, it's named by Persia. You know, it's named. There's a, uh, an African contingent to that that has Kush and uh, Libya. Uh, there is Gomer. There is uh, presumably what looks to be 
at least from present day, looks to be Turkey and, and Russia. So we know those are key players. So whatever happens in this conflict, if this is some, a Psalm 83 type scenario, then those other external players are still in play at the end of all that. So I, I, I tend to think that, that um, yeah, that's it. Well, I tend to think that in this, in this, and I know Amir Sarfati doesn't believe this is Psalm 83. I, I think it is. And, and it could be that Psalm right. 83 is this ongoing thing that's been ongoing since 1949 these series of conflicts that are happening. It could be that, or it could be just this time period itself, but I can't, this well, is not anything that like anything Israel's have to, had to deal with as a nation since the Holocaust. And, and they weren't even a nation then. So this is, this is something that they can't let go. And I don't see them finishing this until Hamas is completely destroyed. And they also have to deal with Hezbollah and they also have to deal with Iran's nuclear, uh, you know, race to to finish the the their bomb so i, I, I don't think it's yeah. yeah i think it's worse than that though pete because they have to deal with you know i i've done some work with the idsf israeli defense and security forum general amir Abivi and and the guys there and that's not the only fronts that israel faces israel has I think the Arabs with inside Israel proper, there's some problems there. But you go up into Judea, Samaria, called the West Bank, and 80% of the people there support Hamas. If they had yeah. an election today, Hamas would win. Yeah. Fatah yeah. would be gone. And so that that's in the area. I mean, I've been in those areas, okay? And I've, I've talked to people the Arabs that live there and they, they support Hamas. They hate Fatah. They hate the Palestinian authority. And so that's another front that Israel has to deal with. And, and now they're also bringing weapons in to the Judea Samaria from Jordan. Yep. And now Egypt, Egypt's in a crisis because the revenues down from the, uh, Suez Canal has been cut by at least 40%. And that's a major part of their government budget. They just built that big new new Cairo or whatever they call it, the new capital city. And then down the down the river, you got <laughs> Ethiopia damming up the Nile. Yep. And it's going to cause water prop, it's probably going to cause water problems in Egypt. Yeah. And so it's sort of like it's like this cascading domino effect that we're seeing everywhere. It, here's some here's some possible scenarios that, that could play out, right? And if if we think about World War I, we know what I'm about to say doesn't sound as crazy when you look at how World War I started, where a no-name Archduke Franz Ferdinand gets assassinated in Serbia uh, that, that triggers uh, Russia coming in to fight against Austria and then Germany declaring war against them, and then uh, UK, uh, the UK and France coming in to side with Russia. So, I mean, it these things can happen very quickly. So here's some possible scenarios that could play out. And I think, like you say, I think they cascade on each other. I think it's like this domino effect. But once this floodgate opens, I think it's just going to come out. It's going to come out hard. But, for instance, and I know they don't seem connected at the moment, but I'll connect the dots at the end. Sure. If in Russia... If, if, say, Emmanuel Macron, who's calling for boots on the ground in Ukraine, and he's calling for an escalation, you've got the Democrats and the Warhawk rhinos in, in Congress calling for an escalation, or at least a continuance of operations in Ukraine. Let's just say, hypothetically, that a stray missile hits Poland when they trigger Article 5 of, of the Charter, or boots on the ground are discovered and Putin says, hey, that's my red line, we are steamrolling Ukraine. Right, we're going to keep going, or you know, whatever the case is, we're going to move into take over Lithuania, we're going to move into Poland, or whatever the case is. They are not going to do that in a bubble, or they're not going to do that in isolation. When they do that, this will trigger um, China taking Taiwan, because right now they're partnered, and we've driven, we've driven Russia, we've done the, we've committed the worst sin of the geopolitical sin in terms of creating this alliance of nations that hate them. We've, we've pushed them together instead of keeping them separated. We've driven them all into each other's arms through sanctions and through all the things we've been doing, especially with Russia. Now Russia and China are allied. 
Now, if Russia takes takes all of Ukraine, not just the Donbass region, but keeps going, um, they could say, hey, China, take take Taiwan, because now what that's going to do is that's going to split the U.S. forces between a Pacific operations and a European theater. And then at the same time, they could trigger another ally that they have, North Korea. Hey, now's a great time to take South Korea, because you know what? Uh, the U.S. forces aren't <laughs> they're, they're stretched so thin already uh, amongst everything else going on. Tur- Turkey could take Cyprus, could take the rest of Cyprus, you know. Uh, I mean, there's any number of things that could kick off. And oh, by the way, this is when Hezbollah. So it these things could spiral out of control very, very quickly. And I think this all ties back into who's going to be the next president, because I think if they see that Biden is not going to be the next guy and they don't see any way that Trump can lose this thing. They know they're going to have to do whatever they're going to do now ahead of time before that change of administration happens and the U.S. becomes serious again about its foreign policy in a different way than what we've seen, what the world has seen with the Biden administration and how inept they uh, performed going back from the catastrophe that was the Afghanistan withdrawal to all the other responses that we haven't we refuse to take on to the borders, to all the other issues and the corruption within the Biden administration. If Biden stays in or some Democrat flavor stays in beyond 2024, they say, well, we have time. We have time to do what we need to do. We can do this more strategically, but they may feel pinched for time if Trump comes back into office. And I'm not saying that I'm advocating for that. I'm just saying I'm trying to look at it from their perspective, you know, play devil's advocate in this regard to look at it. How would they look at it? How does Putin look at this? Or how does Xi look at this from his foxhole? If the change of guard does happen. And now the U S becomes very serious again about how it's going to do operations around the world instead of this kind of uh, neophyte. Yeah, but, but you're a military guy. How quickly can you reconstitute something that's been let to, so I don't want to put you in a spot, but you were in the military, you know, so you've been out a few years, but did you see a change in readiness over the time that you were in? And oh, yeah. so in what direction? Yeah. So from 2002, when I, when I came back in as an officer to 2012, I say that, that the U S military had largely been ground down with repeat deployments over and over and over. So many folks were getting out. So um, that was already a significant issue, but at the time they were able to maintain enough folks by throwing bonuses at them and stuff. Uh, to keep them in, to keep that experience level in. Now, but between 2012 and say 2021, or whenever the Afghanistan withdrawal, or in say 2020, um, there has been a significant um, atrophying of our capabilities in, in terms of the conventional forces. And then from 2020 on, I, I say it's it's gotten s- seriously worse um, with a lot of, uh, you know, look at where the Army and the Marines and the other uh, ground forces, where are they drawing the majority of their population from to, to join the ranks? It's predominantly white males from the South. Yeah. And when you way, demonize white males from the South, they by have the no way, people who think we're, we're sort of being a little bit dark and gloomy. Uh, this is the, this is the upbeat part of the program that we, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I just, I, I mean, it, it's, it's hard it's, to talk about this because we all want it to be, you know, just like normal. And, and to a lot of people, they're, what, what are you talking about? What's going on? Yeah. It's the days of Noah for those people. Yeah. And, and so I, I think, I think what the military in the department of defense, the Pentagon, everybody re- recognizes is that um, we are nowhere near, I mean, we can't even meet the recruitment numbers that, that we need to sustain a normal standing force now. So they're beginning to drop off, uh, cut back on, certain sections of the military that that account for the numbers, the total numbers that we're supposed to have in the force um, saying, hey, these these positions aren't really necessary. They're redundant, whatever. So they're dropping that number down. They're trying to sugarcoat it that way. But where I think they're going to augment with um, the lack of manpower is going to be with drones. And it's going to be with uh, drones, with swarming technology, robotics, all the things that were science fiction about 15 years ago are now um, are going to be put in play increasingly. Um, to augment the lack of manpower boots on the ground. So, yeah, this is an article from the Wall Street Journal the other day about drone swarms. 
And and I'm seeing the videos. I mean, I, I saw these tweets from Hezbollah guy yesterday, and he's saying, ah, you know, look, uh, yeah, Iron Dome shot down a couple of our drones, you know, or our, or our cheap rockets that, that cost us under $2,000 each to build. And each Iron Dome missile is seventy thousand dollars. We're winning because we're bleeding them out of money. And so the the article here in the Wall Street Journal last I think Saturday or Monday, it says you know you've got this thirteen billion dollar Gerald Ford, the new aircraft carrier, probably the you know the most sophisticated one ever built in human history. And it's like it could be disabled by a hypersonic missile or a drone swarm. And, and the bang for the buck is incredible, but it, it's completely changing warfare. Now, let's let's just say hypothetically that that Trump does come back in office and he upholds um, the security agreements with Israel and Taiwan and robustly provides armament, uh, weapons, ammo, et cetera, funding for, for them to carry out whatever executions they need to carry out. Um, the Israeli Air Force at present has 36 F, uh, F-35s, they have 58 F-15s, they have 25 F-151s, uh, 99 F-16s, and then 97 F-16-1, uh, or okay, F-16-9s. So let, me, let me interrupt you. What's the range of like an F-35? How far can they fly with a full payload of bombs? And I mean fly outbound and back. Uh, well, Iran is 590 miles, roughly almost 600 miles. And depending on where in Iran they have to go to. So about 600 miles, I think they'd have to have refuelers on station. So that's what they were. Uh, the Biden administration was supposed to give them, um, sell them some refuelers, aerial refuelers, which I think they've pushed back to like next year. So yeah, I think it was 2026 or 2027, because we don't even have enough in yeah. the U.S., military and, we, and we've drained a lot of our our excess uh weapons and, and ammo to throwing it away into the black hole um in in other conflicts so we've given so much away that we don't have enough for ourselves but you're right that they would need they would need refueling uh capabilities to be able to strike iran and then come back if they were able to transit over saudi airspace now another complication to all of this is now that you've added iran uh uh Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, um, and Ethiopia into BRICS, along with Russia, India, China, <laughs> South Africa. So, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia may say, hey, you can't transit our airspace anymore. And obviously, Iraq's not going to let them do it. And Turkey's not going to let them do it. So if they have to travel further around, I mean, they would absolutely have to have refueling capabilities in order to go there and back. Now, again, if they have... If you have limited options, not your, let's say you have a lot of options, but a lot of them are not good, right? And you're Israel, and you've got enemies to the north, to the south, internal to your borders with Judea and Samaria, as well as those ring of proxies around, you know, and the Houthis and, and other uh, groups out there that are hostile to Israel. What, what options do you have when it comes to a Psalm 83 type scenario? And I think you make you 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 hit hard, you, especially with say Hezbollah because they don't have the hostage situation. They don't have that problem, that crisis there with Hezbollah like they do with Hamas. They have to fight with kind of kid gloves with Hamas in order to ensure they don't kill their own hostages and trying to rescue them. With Hezbollah though, in say Damascus, they could hit hard. They could punch really hard, make an example of them to the point that nobody really wants to mess with them. And that leaves that Gog Magog coalition, that outer ring that down the road say, you know what, we're getting revenge. <laughs> we're coming back and we're going to, that's, that may be part and parcel why that coalition helps form the way it does because of how hard they punch at the end of all this. Yeah. Just a theory. Yeah. So, um, uh, what so so in terms of um, so somebody said we're not talking about Bible prophecy. I'm not sure where they're getting that, but because uh, we're talking about what the real world in which we live. But yeah. uh, 
where do you see this going in the near term? Well, um, I wrote back in October, right after October 7th, I had an article called Equivocation. And I, and I saw, I, I pretty much, I'm not a prophet. I'm not even claiming to be a prophet. I just was looking at this from a common sense perspective and things have pretty much played out that way, according with the, the Democrat population uh, leading the country, as well as the global uh, backlash against Israel for this continued, the longer this goes on, the longer, the less goodwill there's going to be out there. So I think whatever they're going to have to do, they're going to have to do it in a shorter rather than long, you know, shorter rather than than lengthier time period, at least with Hamas. Um, I, I don't know. I don't. I, I think at some point they're going to get clarification on what the, the status is of the hostages, and that's going to drive uh, how they finish off Hamas. And I think that they cannot, they're not going to end this operation until Hamas is completely gone as a, as an organization. Now they're, they're not going to, they're never going to end that hostility. That's, that's, um, been brewing there for decades. Um, but it, removing the Hamas is going to be a significant emotional victory for Israel, uh, and for the Netanyahu, uh, this coalition government he's got going on right now. Now in terms of Hezbollah, that obviously they, that's something they cannot leave undone. They obviously everybody that lives in the Golan Heights and in Northern Israel is at risk and that's going to disrupt operations. So I think that's something that they're going to have to deal with here soon this year. And so th that's where I see them punching really hard and, and then in making an example of them and possibly even uh, taking out Iran's nuclear capabilities and I don't mean with a thing like Stuxnet, like they did back in what was it, 2008 or so, or, or 2010. Um, I mean, significantly delaying it to the sense that that it would take them years to try and rebuild what they had. Um, so whatever that looks like, I'm sure Israel has uh, cards up their sleeve that they're not they're not really revealing to people, um, just like we do, and just like every other nation does. So I think there's probably things already ongoing in both of those fronts between Hezbollah and Israel or Hezbollah and Iran. And again, I, I'm of the belief that the elections of this year are going to be incredibly consequential. So whoever wins, whether the Democrats stay in power, whether Trump wins, but he loses the Congress, whatever that looks like, I think it's going to be incredibly not only consequential for the United States, because I think that that could trigger a lot of different scenarios but it's going to be consequential for our relationships with other nations around the world, whether they choose to act now or choose to wait. And by that, I mean like taking Ukraine or taking Taiwan or, or making moves against Cyprus and other things that, that have been boiling under the uh, radar for a long time. So um, I don't know. I don't know, but I do think that, that Israel is going to finish Hamas this year. And I think that they will have to deal with Hezbollah this year. Yeah, I don't, I don't see how that happens. And then in the meantime, they have to sort of keep control over things in the West Bank. And, you know, and God, look, God, God can intervene at any point in time to make yeah. things different. But, you know, that's, um, I don't have, um, I, <laughs> like you, I don't have that gift of, of seeing exactly how that's going to happen. So I have to, I live in a real world. You know, that's what I, uh, you know, what, you know, I, I, you know I, what? I look both ways before I cross the street. <laughs> you know, what would be interesting to me, and I've thought about this quite a bit for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so why is Israel significant to the Arab world? It, Jerusalem's never mentioned in the Quran. I mean, there's, there's, that's right. there's no, there's no, um, other than the fact that the Ottoman Empire used to control the territory and you had a number of different caliphs that prior right. to the Ottomans that controlled it and then the Crusaders, etc., and the Byzantine Empire going back to the Romans. Um, what is significant about what, what is the main thing that is holding Arabs attention to Israel? And I think it's the 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 Temple Mount. I think it's the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. What if in all of this conflagrations that go on, are going on? What if the Muslims publicly and very visibly accidentally destroy their own shrines? What if right. they do it and there's no denying that they did it? You can't, it, it, there's just no way to, to disprove. I mean, it's going to be clear as day that they destroyed, 
they, they've lost whatever, the, whatever incentive they've had to fight for the Temple Mount, they've lost it. So I think that that could be also a scenario that a, kind of a black swan scenario that happens. And then that, that tends to, to uh, diffuse a lot of the internal tension to with the Arabs there saying, Hey, we just destroyed our own, <laughs> our own holy sites. And uh, you've got Saudi Arabia now saying eh, that place isn't really that important to us. Um, you know, really Mecca and Medina are the two significant places for us. And, and then obviously Iran has its own shrines there in their, their country. And so, Israel becomes less of less important to them and is not worth the existential pain that would cause them if they were to go against Israel. So that's also a scenario that could ha- that very easily happen. Um, obviously, I think that would be more of a God thing where, say, Hezbollah launches a bunch of missiles and some of them kind of are nudged by the finger of God over a little bit so that they take out <laughs> the, the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And then, boom, that, that nullifies... Any uh, it takes out the fire, takes the fire out of their their fight um, to want to fight for the Temple Mount when they've destroyed their own shrines. It's interesting, you know, back in the Gulf War, back in the 90s, when uh, Saddam Hussein was launching those Scud missiles, Scud, S-C-U-D, sure could use direction, I think is what they nickname it. The A lot of the Orthodox would run to the Western wall and pray that it would hit the dome of the rock <laughs> so they <laughs> yeah. could rebuild their temple. And and that could happen. I mean, you know, that, that's not out of the realm of possibility because it, particularly when the, the stuff coming from Gaza was not precision, they just sort of threw it out there and it landed where it landed. But it's just so people know there's the picture up there is a picture of the temple mount. And that does seem to be the epicenter. That's that's the thing. That's Zion. This is God's holy mountain. This is this is important to God. And it's it's it has been and it will be. We know that going into the future that this is important. So the question is, how is this going to come about? It's interesting that there seems to be a division within the Islamic world right now between what I would call the southern Sunni and the northern. Sunni slash Shia branches of Islam. Saudi Arabia has come out and published that Islam really had nothing to do, that that the farthest mosque where Muhammad supposedly went and made his famous night journey, it doesn't say Jerusalem in the Quran, that it, it, it really was down near Mecca. It was a mosque near Mecca in Saudi Arabia. It had nothing to do with the Temple Mount. Yeah. So it, it's made up, but you know, I, I've been inside. It used to be able to go in the Dome of the Rock, and I was able to go inside the Dome of the Rock uh, in one of my first trips to Israel. And it is an abomination. The, the early, some of the earliest parts of the Quran that they know exists are are panels inside that Dome of the Rock, and one of them says God has no son. So there's an abomination right there already on the Temple Mount. But Saudi Arabia has been fairly public about the fact that we really don't have a claim to that. Now, uh, King Abdullah II of Jordan constantly brings this up, but it's it's kind of brought up in the context of he has a problem. He has 80% of his country as Palestinians, including his wife, the queen. And so he, he has to maintain these positions. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, I don't know. It's, I, I, look, I wish I knew exactly how this all played out. I would write a book. <laughs> um, and then, you know, it's, it's sort of like, I think if people are writing books like right now, they need to be sort of loose leaf or, yeah. or electronic so they can be changed easily. <laughs> um, you know, written in pencil. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I find I find that, uh, you know, there are things that happen in the world that defy logical explanation. And, and even if you look within, say, our own politics, you know, uh, we had the Republican majority Congress and then we had this complete rhino up there, uh, you know, basically just kind of doing whatever was best for him. He got 
unbelievably got removed and then you get this conservative guy. Now I'm not, I'm not saying that Mike Johnson is the answer to our prayer. I'm not saying that I'm, I'm just saying that things happen that, that just, that defy any of our expectations or our, really, you know, any, any of our wildest dreams that things could happen like that. So I just look at, I what's the big draw to Jerusalem? What's the big draw to Israel? And it's the dome of the rock. It's this, claim that we got to fight to keep this this temple mount and when you take away the the reason for them to fight um you know i think that could it's take a lot of fire out of their out of their esteem and and so then now there there's no real cause for them to do that but you still have that angst from the magog gog magog coalition that's still outside the ring there so I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we'll have to wait and see, obviously. I mean, I'm not, I'm holding to these theories very loosely. So. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's an amazing time to be alive. I mean, we can see all of these things um, playing out. Um, and um, so I'm going to, I'm going to make one comment because I see a lot of comments in the chat about Israel controls, everything people you're, don't be silly on our channel, okay? Israel doesn't control everything. If they controlled everything, they would be getting everything they want from this administration, and they're not. Get a reality check, okay? And I I saw a great thing. at the. Did you go to pre-trip study group this past year, Pete? No, I didn't. Okay. So there, there was a great panel at the end. It was Randall Price and J.B. Hickson and Arnold Fruchtebaum and a professor from Liberty, and I can't remember it. And I thought this was a, a really good response because somebody got up and said, why should we care about Israel? Because they, they've they rejected the Messiah. They have uh, immoral people in their country. They're depraved. And... I think the response was pretty wise. One, this is part of God's plan, whether you like it or not. It's pretty clear from scripture. And yeah. secondly, this Liberty professor said this, you need to exercise grace towards Israel in the measure of grace in their unbelief, in the measure of grace was shown towards you when you were in unbelief. And I thought that was a very wise response. We know how this all plays out. And so I, I just think that this uh, spiking the ball that, oh, well, they don't believe in all this other thing. We should just forget them. And listen, that's, that's just not the way the Bible says it's going to work out. Go read Romans 9, 10, and 11. Mm -hmm. And nobody is saying that Israel is perfect. Okay. I've been there. I know them. And by the way, I know a lot of people here in the United States, and I've not met one of them yet either. But there is a there is a plan that God has to work this out that he has prophesied for a long time. And I don't think we get to say, well, you know, we don't really, you know, we're not really comfortable with the way you're going to work that out, God. I, I just don't think that's for us to say. Mm -hmm. And And listen, we also know that there's a lot of, you know, there, there's these prophecies about, you know, the Egypt and, and other countries, the, the highway uh, mm -hmm. that runs from Red Sea to, to Iran. There are going to be a lot of Muslims come to know the Lord, too. Yeah. So And so we're just sort of talking about the way this geopolitics is playing out. So we have the Bible, and the Bible has pretty specific things, but it also leads to, I think, in the, where we are right now, a lot of what I would call righteous speculation as to how this is going to play. And that's fine. Okay. And we don't all have to agree on exactly how it's going, but I'm just telling you, I sit here and I look and I look at all these different lines of Bible prophecy. I can just tell you that there's been, a, I've been doing this for 30 years or more. There's a huge change, huge change in what's happened. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I think because the level of barbarity that ta the attack on October 7th happened and they didn't have anything to equate it. The only thing they could equate it to was the Holocaust and, and the scale and the violence that was done against civilians. Um, 
you know, and I and I and I I wrote about this in again in that same article. I I mentioned that this would be one of those dividing issues for the the MAGA conservatives because a lot of the as the as this MAGA conservative coalition begins to broaden the tent and it's bringing in more and more people um, that are unhappy or unsatisfied with the economy. They're unhappy. They're unsatisfied with the direction the country's going in or the way the country's going in the, the eyes of the world and so forth. Um, they are looking at this purely as a geopolitical problem, whereas you and I and other watchmen look at this as it is a geopolitical issue that's playing out according to Bible prophecy. And we need to keep our outline of Bible prophecy that shows the, the specific players that are playing the outcomes of these things as the that stuff's written in permanent marker. The other stuff that's that's happening in between and how this gets from point A to point C we don't know exactly how B is going to play out because the Bible doesn't talk about it or doesn't mention it. We just know that it ends up there. Just like we know at the midpoint of the tribulation, there is an abomination that causes desolation. That that leads me to co- uh, logically conclude, if I were to backwards plan, as I was taught in the military to do, that if there is a abomination that causes desolation that's similar or reminiscent of what Daniel was speaking of in Daniel 9.27, then there, there has to be a Jewish temple in order for there to be a Jewish temple that the Jews have to be in control of the temple Mount in order for them to control the temple Mount. They've got to control Jerusalem in order for them to control Jerusalem. They have to be a nation again because the Arabs aren't going to do this. The Gentile world's not going to do this. Like, I mean, it has to be something that that comes from Israel. So when you backwards plan from that, it just leads you to the, to the understanding that this is how it's going to play out. We don't know exactly, you know, when, when people uh, were looking at, um, let's say people back in the 1800s were looking at prophecies like Amos 9, 14 and 15, uh, or uh, Isaiah 11, 11, um, in the other passages speaking about Israel coming back as a nation again, uh, Luke 21, 24, I think. Um, they, they didn't understand how Israel was going to come to be a nation again after so many, you know, almost two millennia in diaspora. How are they going to do it? They could not have foreseen that the whole Middle East was going to be, you know, was at that time in the 1800s was under the control of the Ottoman Empire. They weren't going to they didn't know that there was going to be a yeah. world war and World War One or the Great War and that the Ottomans would at the, kind of the last moment join with the Axis powers and or the central powers and lose. And then in the process of losing their whole empire is going to be carved up. And that the British would control it. And then at a certain point, another war would kick off in Europe, another Second World War. And that, you know, the World War One prepared the land for the people and World War II prepared the people for the land because of the Holocaust. I mean, we, nobody in the 1800s could have foreseen that, but that's exactly how it played out. So just like we're here now, we're kind of looking ahead saying, how is this going to actually work out? I mean, we just we have what the Bible says and we try and find what makes sense. In, uh, from a biblical standpoint, how does it? How do we think it could play out? And we're just talking about these things. We're not saying it's definitively going to happen. So, and it absolutely has everything to do with Bible prophecy because all of the last days is going to center around the nation of Israel. Yeah, I mean, there are certain things, you know, like Matthew twenty four talks about prayer or flight not be on Shabbat, and it doesn't really make any sense unless Israel's in control of. There's a Jewish state that recognizes <coughs> Shabbat. I mean, try to get a bus in Jerusalem on Shabbat. It's the they or cap. They don't exist because there's a Jewish state of control. And in Ezekiel chapter 36, it does says we're going to, God's going to draw them back in unbelief yeah. and they're going to be brought back. Not because they deserve it. It's sort of, it's a picture of grace. Really. They're going to be brought back. And unbelief, not because they deserve it, because my name is at stake. I said I would restore yeah. them. And then it says, I will bring them back, and then I will give them a new heart. So we're in that process where they're coming back, and we're waiting for the new heart. Yeah. Now, we think that that, I think that happens at the end of this 70th week time, around the Day of Atonement, that there's this large return, you know, of Jewish people, the remnant to the Lord. They call for him to return. That's what it says in Hosea chapter five, in the chapter five, beginning of uh, chapter six of Hosea, 
So the uh, so we're waiting for that, you know. I it, and it's hard because we're sitting here still looking at things a little bit darkly. And I guess I, we were going to talk maybe about what the term we came up with, which what I suggested to you was Gnostic esket, uh, es, eschatological Gnosticism, where. Yeah. You know, look, I see these all the time. I had a dream about this, 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 and this. And now we see it with the eclipse coming up on April 8th. This is significant. This is really important. This is it. This is going to be. And I think we know after whether something was important. But I just have a problem with jumping the gun somewhat to say it's going to be on this particular date. How many times have we heard this over the last 10 years? 2017 right. now 2024 and i think we all want to get out of here okay uh i told tom hughes last night i'd really would vote for a pre pre-trib rapture at this point you know <laughs> move it even a little bit further forward yep. so um i don't know what I, I i don't i think you might have a different take on the eclipse than i do what's your kind of thought on that no, I wrote about it, um, I don't know, a month or so ago, and, and I basically showed um, um, all of the eclipses that have happened over the Earth. Um, there's a great graphic, and it ha I mean, if you looked at, at this graphic, it would look like a kid scribbled all over the Earth. I mean, there's lines everywhere, you know, right. and there's X's over certain countries and Turkey and other places. And then I, it broke out. I broke out how many eclipses happened exactly seven years apart. And so there's a number of those. And there's just no there's no real way of knowing if this means anything or not. It's interesting for sure. But um, like I said, in 2017, I have the same exact the same exact position as I had back then with regard to the Rev 12 sign and the the, the first eclipse going that way. I'm a wait and see guy. I mean, if it has some prophetic significance, then we'll know after the fact. I mean, it, it would be foolish of me to try and uh, hype everybody up and say, yes, this absolutely means this, and then have to walk everything back afterwards. Well, it was just spiritual or, you know, it was just right, this. Right. Do kind of like what the, the Seventh yeah, okay. day Adventists did in, in the Millerites, <laughs> you know, in their failed prediction. So, yeah, they're I, still sitting out there on the hilltop someplace, some of yeah. them. The, um, and that that's unfortunate. I mean, that's the because I I think there's a false hope that's given to people, and then there's a a crashing of their faith or whatever when it doesn't happen the way everybody said. And I I remember with the was it September twenty third Revelation twelve sign back in yeah September twenty seventeen, so about seven years ago. Um, you know, I I knew a couple guys who really got into that. And they they drove a stake in the ground that this was this was it this was when everything was going to happen, and here we sit about seven years later. And I can tell you, in at least one of those cases, the person is totally crashed and burned. Yeah, you know. And so that's and I I remember having a conversation with the person beforehand saying you need to be careful with this. You need to to back off a little bit. Don't don't and. Nobody ever listens to me. <laughs> so uh, I listen I, to you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But, you know, so the I, I'm just concerned with um, sometimes people saying, well, you know, I've unlocked the key to everything. And I've, I say this all the time. I have stacks of books and papers and things around here that people send me. And I'm, I'm not saying don't send me stuff. But I'm saying is sometimes don't. You 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 want to uh, don't be too sure of yourself. You know, but throw a little humble pie in there. Yeah, uh, I've said that uh, the part of the dessert menu at uh, the beam is, at the uh, marriage supper of the lamb is going to be humble pie. <laughs> and I uh, because I think I think we all need to be. I, I don't know. I just had this feeling that someday we'll we'll stand in front of the Lord and the Lord will say something like, I mean, "You guys were arguing about what, <laughs> yeah. and and you thought it was going to work out this way." Well, we'll see. So I think we need to be paying attention to what the scriptures say, but then look at how this. You know, um, I put all my stuff in PowerPoint now, so I can 
edit it easily. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I, I do think we just uh, have a um, a uh, very interesting time in front of us. So maybe we need to wrap this up. So give me some thoughts and we'll bring it to a close here. Well, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the geopolitics, I've already kind of laid out what I think is going to happen. I don't know for sure. This is just what makes sense in my mind. But to the other subject, to the uh, eschatological Gnosticism, um, I, I remember doing research on on Gnosticism when I was doing my presentation a couple of years ago in Colorado uh, on the Book of Jude. And what was interesting to me is that, I, I mean, I, I have... Uh, dozens of these false teachings, these heresies that that you know I can put into different categories, whether it was Christological, mm -hmm. pneuma, pneuma to, you know, the on the Holy Spirit or the Trinity or these other things, and kind of categorize them that way. And you know, the early church fathers were were pretty successful in in rooting out and, and calling out these heresies, and 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 basically these things kind of drifted off into the background. And here they are again in the, the late 1900s in the 20th century and now the 21st century being repackaged and recycled and just called a different name. And they've all come back in vogue. And so I, I think uh, Gnosticism, uh, not, not to get all in the weeds about it, but I mean, the, the basic three premises of Gnosticism, because it's, it's very much like the emergent church movement in the sense that it's very decentralized. There's no there's no religion called Gnosticism. There's no religion called the emergent church. There are groups within that have different varying flavors of holding to different things. And so it's hard to nail it to the wall necessarily, but they believe in a dualistic anthropology that the two natures, the spirit is good. The flesh is bad. They have a du mm -hmm. dualistic theology that there's a good God. And then there's a bad God. The good God is the monad. The bad God is Sophia who creates the demiurge and, and then the last part of it is, is the gnosis, the secret knowledge. I, I have this secret knowledge that nobody else knows. And I think when we hear people, and I don't want to say it's all charismatic, but I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of, it, it's, it runs wild, runs rampant in charismatic circles where they still promote it, um, the gift of prophecy. Um, I, I'm not a cessationist either. I think it exists. I, I just, I think it, there's a lot of abuse that happens inside of this, these circles. Um but that's that's where a lot of people begin to put overemphasis on their own personal subjective dreams or visions or whatever. And I've had things happen to me supernaturally. I don't know what to make of it. I've talked about it publicly after I waited about six years, seven years before I mentioned it publicly. But I don't know what to make of it. And I'm not going to build any doctrine off of it. I just know that it had this reaction in my life and it caused me to turn to a different you know path and to get back on path. Yeah, you know, um, I think not... I think we I think we've all had kind of those experiences. Just let me share one that I had. So, <laughs> I'm not I'm not one that believes you're supposed to tithe. Okay, I, I'm not sure that the I I think that everything we have belongs to the Lord in the New Testament. So, you know, then the argument becomes you have to tithe or whatever. So I was I was in college. I was getting married. We were engaged, and I had not I had not sent any money to church. Or given any money. So I looked at how much I had in my checking account, how much and how much I had made that year. And the amount of my checking account was like one penny more than what a tithe would have been for what I had earned that year. And so I was convicted. So I wrote a check, left like a penny in my checking account. I took it down and went on like in the end into the post office. And by the way, I had just been laid off from a job two weeks ago. So I hear I'm getting married. Pam and I had already bought a car. I've got a car payment. It's like $90 a month. And, you know, she's working, but she's paying her school bills. And, and so anyway, and we're trying to, you know, save up money for apartment, you know, deposit and that type of thing for when we're getting married in a few months. So I take the check down. I put it in the mail. I went back up a couple blocks back up to campus and I had two job offers. <laughs> now I didn't do it because I thought I would get some job offers, but the Lord blessed me, I think. So I, um, you know, so I, I think, you know, we, there's this, this right living part of that a lot of times gets, 
miss that there's, you know, we're supposed to live in a certain way. And, and I'm not, I'm not puffing myself up because that was totally unexpected, but sometimes I see people, they sort of trot around their prophetic gift a little bit too much. I, I don't know. I, it, it just, it's always bothered me. Uh, cause I've seen some of the worst, uh, manifestations of word faith cults when I was younger. And it's just, it's awful. People get stuck up in that. So I think that, uh, um, we, we need to be careful. And so your, your teaching from a couple of years ago is right. There is this, there's a lot of false teaching out there that we need to be careful about. I mean, the book of Jude, um, what was it that was a Chuck Missler used to call that the act, the, the acts of the apostates. The acts of the apostates. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think that was right. So yeah, if, you a, if you get a chance, there's a great interview with Chuck Missler and Kim Clement and Kim Clement, I guess, toward the end of his life, repented publicly. Oh, did he really? Church. Okay. Oh yeah. 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 He, he came forward and he actually flew Chuck Missler out to New Zealand and, and sat under his tutelage. He sat there in the audience with everybody else under Chuck's tutelage for however long it was several months or so. And okay, he, I was not, a, I'm not, I, I know that there's a lot of question about Chuck because he, this association with Kim Coleman at the end. And, you know, that's kind of interesting because I see people, they're kind of caught up in error and everything, and then they repent, but nobody wants to forgive them. Yeah. You know, the, the grace doesn't get exercised sometimes. What, so but I'll the, have to look the, into that. The, the one point I was going to say about this interview that he had was that he considered himself a prophet before, you know, he repented and did all that. Sure. But none of his sure. prophecies were biblically based and none of them were even eschatological in nature. They were prophecies about Trump or, or not Trump, but you know, the shield Paul, you know, things like that. Sure. And he came back and after he sat under Chuck's tutelage, he's like, I, I was so wrong. I, he was like, I, I hated, I hated Bible prophecy because it was so gloomy and depressing. And, but when you understand um, what lays ahead for us and when you put your lives in, you know, if you, even if you live to be 99 or 120, when you put that in comparison to eternity, I mean, it's nothing. It's like a little grain of sand on the longest beach in the entire universe. It, it's nothing in comparison to what the, the glory that lays ahead for us. And so we have a short, like Lee says, we know we have a, a few short years to be a good soldier and we have all of eternity to, to bask in the glory of, of our Lord and Savior. So it is tough, but I also believe that God specifically chose you and I and everybody on here with us today and everybody alive today to live in this generation, to be eyewitnesses to the events ongoing. And who knows, you know, maybe in the millennial kingdom, you and I are teaching those people then who had no concept of the way the world used to be. Maybe we're teaching history classes, you know, or something. I don't know from a, from a biblical perspective saying, Hey, this is, it would be like, we have no concept really of the way the world was before the flood, other than what the Bible says. Um, and yeah. what, what there is a little pieces here and there about the way the world was before the flood. Most all that was all washed away. So in ages to come, I mean, we may be, we were eyewitnesses here to the very end. And, and so um, I don't know. I mean, I just kind of think about things in that perspective that it's an honor to be alive right now. It's an honor to be in the service of the Lord and, you doing what you're doing and what I'm doing and what our brothers, Tom and, and the rest of these guys are out there doing, trying to, to be a sound, a sounding board of, of sound doctrine on a, on an internet platform and on the internet in general with so much wacky teaching out there and so much false teaching. We're trying to give people good places to go to, to get solid teaching and, and, um, and kind of a refuge in this vast wilderness of the internet, the ethernet. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, that's always a fear of mine. Uh, I mean, we, look, we just started putting stuff up on YouTube because people weren't able to be there every Sunday. And then the Internet changed everything. OK, so um, it's um, it's very strange um, to me sometimes that the people that I run into, Oh, I, I watch you on YouTube and it's like, wow, you know, you got to really <laughs> watch what you're doing sometimes. And, yeah. um, yeah, I don't know. You know, that's interesting. We'll have to talk about that in the future about 
what's this whole millennium thing going to be like for us? Because, yeah. you know, uh, the, the, it, it looks like in Ezekiel 40 to 48, it, this really drives a lot of people crazy that there actually are sacrifices in the temple, mm -hmm. a rebuilt temple. Well, what are they for? Because Jesus paid it all. But there's like this remembrance thing that goes along with this period of time. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so anyway, hey, do this for me. Uh, I really appreciate you doing this. We'll have to do this again soon. And uh, just let me give you a, a couple things. So I've got my interview that I did with Avraham uh, Levine from Alma Research coming up at 2.30. You can watch that. It's a premiere. You can get on and chat. Just be nice to everybody. <laughs> and, um, you know, don't act. <laughs> but then I've, I've um, trolled. I've trolled my own pre-recorded videos. I've trolled myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, look at this idiot. Oh, yeah. What, what's your what's your made up screen name again? I, <laughs> no, uh, I'm just kidding. And <clears throat> and um, and so then and I do each week at at uh, usually one o'clock on Tuesdays. Um, I think it's 1 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'll do a little Q&A with Tom Hughes. And I did something with Tom Hughes. Yesterday we did a Q&A, but then maybe the Lord was, maybe it was the Lord protecting everybody from us for a while. So, because we had like a half hour where his internet was down, so we couldn't do anything. And then I did his five, I did his Wednesday night thing that's only on the app and everything. And then I've got some interviews coming up. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be doing Seth Fransman, uh, General Miravivi, some other people from Israel. They're going to talk about the things that are going on over there. So I think that, um, so just pay attention to that. I know Pete, you're, you've got a, you were at, at what is it, the uh, rev310.net? Yeah, yeah. And then you're also yeah. on different podcasts and that type of thing. And we both occasionally get invited to speak at conferences. And um, We haven't spoken at the same conference, have we? No, no. I think we've come close a couple times, but it just didn't quite work out. So I'm supposed to do one in the fall with Brandon and Tom. I think it's going to be in Texas or Oklahoma. Uh, that's in early September. Okay. And then, so anyway, just, I, I'll post on my Facebook and Twitter and I think I'm a true social getter, Telegram, Twitter, and uh, YouTube and stuff. So, um, so Pete, I'm just going to ask you to just, would you just kind of close this out in a word of prayer and then we'll let everybody get on their, get on their way. Absolutely. All right, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the time and the fellowship together just to come and, and uh, talk about uh, things and try to understand the times in which we live, Lord. We just uh, we thank you for our salvation, for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins, Lord, because without him, none of us would have any hope whatsoever. Uh, we thank you, Father, for the, the free gift of salvation that by your shed blood, we are able to be reconnected to you and can spend eternity with you. Lord, I thank you for everybody here today that was watching. Uh, pray for them. I pray for their uh, personal lives, for any issues that they may be ongoing, whether it's health or uh, finances or whatever the case may be. Lord, I pray for them and I pray that you know their their situations, Lord, better than, than we do. And I pray that you would work all these things to your glory. Lord, and I just lift up John, Lord. I lift him up uh, and pray for his ministry and pray that you would uh, watch over and keep him safe and and guide and direct him and give him discernment, Father, and as he moves forward and continues to do good work, Father, for the kingdom. And Lord, I just, uh, I, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for being alive at this time and, and allowing us to see these things uh, unfold. And Lord, we just, uh, we don't understand everything. We just uh, we keep a keep a wary eye out. But Lord, we also are looking up and ready for you to come back for us, Lord. And it's on all these things I pray in your son's name. Amen. Yeah, like what you said there. Remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said, guys, <laughs> the prophets long to live at this time. And I think that's a instruction for us that all these prophets long to live at the time that we live at really, you know, the time of the signs, I guess is the best way to say it. So guys, everybody, thanks. Pete, thanks. We'll do it again. 
Absolutely. And God bless everybody. Hang on a minute, Pete. I'll talk to you after we sign off. Okay. Hang on. Bye.